All right, I'm hoping I can uh, cover everything sufficiently. I uh, usually with something like this, like a mini series, I'll do it like kind of episode by episode. But I figure with this and Mare of Easttown, I can just do kind of condensed as one, um, since they all feel like they're a complete story. Especially with uh, the announcement that the White Lotus is going to be an anthology series uh, from here on, however else long it goes. Um, and I, another thing was that this was kind of last minute because. While I was, like, you know, it first popped up on HBO Max, and it was like, oh, Steve Zahn is in that. I'll probably watch that eventually, just because I will watch pretty much anything that he's in. And I didn't, he was the only one I kind of saw in the picture, so I didn't really get a look at the rest of the cast and who all it was. And then it kind of started to slowly blow up, and I kept getting it recommended to me, and... So, and, and especially given the fact that uh, I loved Big Little Lies so much, at least the first season, and that it's basically, it, it, to really, really, really simplify it, uh, you could almost call it Big Little Lies Goes to Hawaii, basically, <laughs> um, up to it, including the whole reveal of um, somebody is dead, and then we're going to circle back around, and then the whole, there'll be kind of a mystery element as to who that is, but there's so much going on apart from that um, that you might even sometimes forget um, the whole mystery surrounding that one of these people will eventually die. Because um, I, I feel like it could take away from what all else is going on and all the other characters if you get a little too focused on that. Um, but this handles that so well. That's not, that's not really even a problem you have to worry about because you'll get sucked into it enough um, that it'll, that balance will always be there. And... Another thing that was really appealing to me that I didn't know until somebody told me was that uh, Mike White was behind this and Burton directed all the episodes. And of course, um, TV-wise, Mike White is known for Enlightened, um, which was really big for Laura Dern, uh, which I never watched, but I always heard great things about. But I am very familiar with Mike White as, as far as a screenwriter. Where he's got lighter movies, like, you know, School of Rock and stuff like that. I think Orange County is one of his. Um, but he's also got such a dark side. <laughs> a wo a wonderfully hilarious dark side with movies like Chuck and Buck. Which is a movie I only saw once. But it's got one line in it that is just etched in my brain forever. Uh, as is that movie. And he did stuff like The Good Girl with Jennifer Aniston and Jake Gyllenhaal. And, uh... Recently, a few years ago, uh, Brad Status with Ben Stiller, and all of these, almost all of these projects are just so gloriously uncomfortable, and he has a way of just really bringing in this dark and twisted sense of humor into things, and really getting that whole, those situations that feel like you're a little too close to it, and to the point that they're almost unwatchable because of how uncomfortable they can get, um, and so, some people hate shows or movies like that, um, especially when it, a lot of it is those kind of situations to the point that they can't even watch it, period. Like, not even just, uh, oh, I can't watch this. They just, the whole thing is like a no for them. And I'm kind of one of those people, but what happens is when it starts to get very uncomfortable, I'll just pause it for a second and kind of let it simmer. <laughs> and then when I feel like it, it, it eventually discomfort and oh I can't watch this inevitably turns into okay now I have to know what's about to happen and then that's when you press play again and this show embodies that uh in quite a way like in his as far as the other stuff he's done goes um this will probably be right at the top of that so he can I mean he can also be he did a movie with Samuel Hayek recently called uh Beatrice at Dinner which, um, while I am with him on, like, most of his viewpoints, that's the kind of movie where even if you agree with the protagonist, um, it can be extremely preachy, um, which he can get into at times that might be unappealing, but there's also some of that in here, but the way, the characters in which we see those attitudes through, um, it really gives it a unique vibe, where, like, pretty much everybody on this show is it's not it's not that everybody on this show is a really bad person but like everybody is flawed even the people that seem like for a while it seems like these are you know the good people and these are the really bad nasty people and then that line just kind of blurs 
throughout this the series and then the whole thing where it's just like every everybody has like some really deep flaws some more than others some a lot more than others um where we have Belinda who is probably the most good character I guess you could say who by by the end um has a lot of flaws with her which we'll get into um, but then on the other side of that, on the very opposite end of the spectrum, we have a character like Shane, the Jake Lacey character, who is, like, like, seemingly borderline psychopathic. Like, this, this, <laughs> it feels like in another life, this guy was a serial killer, um, unless he still hasn't gotten quite to that point yet. But, uh, that's really, I guess this would be a good time to say, um, that I'm going to put it in the title, too. Um, this is just going to be a whole spoiler thing. We're just going to go into everything. Um, so, so that whole thing about Shane, uh, almost having the vibes of a serial killer, not entirely off. I mean, the, the death looked pretty accidental, but still, um, if you had told me in the first episode that the death resulted in Shane stabbing somebody, I would not have been a surprise at all. <laughs> So, um, there is that. But talking about, um, kind of the introduction to the characters, which is one of those cases where, with it kind of being only six episodes, you would think it, it would almost feel maybe a tad crammed, depending on how much they want to do, how much they want to expand on all these characters and the few that they kind of bring in throughout that aren't introduced immediately. There could have easily been a problem of losing track of, trying to keep track of everybody, um, which is what's the next show we're going to talk about really has that problem, um, where you kind of have to constant, there's a lot of shows where you kind of have to constantly ask yourself for a while, like, um, who, who are they again and how are they related to this person and all that, but the introductions are so smooth and done in such a, uh, comedic manner where we have, um, Olivia and Paula, who are the college students who are best friends, and, they're just kind of watching everybody come on board, and they're get, and they're doing this whole thing where they're kind of speculating, like, who's who, and in a bit of an exaggerated manner. Um, and then naturally the reveal being the one that they give the uh, most, like, over the, like, the worst possible, that could be who these people are, um, ends up being her parents, uh, Steve Zahn and Connie Brodin. And I feel like just that scene alone not only sets up all the characters... Um, but just the dynamic in general, uh, particularly in the family, uh, and to do that as early as they did and as successfully as they did, um, solves so many problems that a lot of shows kind of have, especially if they're condensed into just six episodes. And I felt like pretty much after that whole introductory scene, when we kind of see them in their individual groups, um, it was, it was quite easy to follow, uh, who was who and how they were connected. Even if the backgrounds they speculated were exaggerated, it still kind of gave you, like, in, in this almost kind of superficial way that ends up actually working out, um, you do kind of get... A, like, you you almost kind of feel like there is a full introduction that where it's like, okay, so that's not what that person is, but it's probably close enough that I feel like I get that character before we've even formally met that character yet. Just strictly from the superficial perspective of Olivia and Paul, it's like, we got enough of a vibe to where it's like, that's that's probably about close anyway. <laughs> um, and uh, obviously, throughout it, um, what's ironic about that is how layered everybody ends up being. Even the people that seem the most basic um, will suddenly have a lot of layers as it goes on and things that kind of unravel about themselves. So it is interesting how it's kind of... It might seem a bit like a judgmental show in a way as far as how it, you know, shows its characters. Um, but then it's actually, like, extremely... Like, there's a lot of humility in how layered the characters are and how everybody gets to have flaws and some worse than others and then some that we might judge negatively might come through in a certain way and change our mind about that. But there's, there's always a balance of what's good and bad about a lot of these people throughout it. It's just a matter of which of those sides is going to come out in which given situation they find themselves in. And talking about just kind of the reality of it, um, a lot of the focus is on um, this family of four plus Paula, um, where we have Steve Zahn and Connie Britton as the married couple, and then... Um, 
Sonny Sweetie's the daughter, the daughter uh, Paula, and then there's also the brother, Quinn, um, Fred Hagginger's character. And what's interesting about these people is how there's a there's an immediate disconnect for a lot of like a lot of like as far as a lot of people watching this, like ninety nine percent of the people watching this, um, if not more. Um, there's going to be a, an immediate disconnect for a lot of the characters that are the guests, um, because they're coming from these rich bubbles, uh, and how it could be really easy, it'd be much easier quickly, um, to relate to the staff working here and having to deal with these people and kind of try to come in and out of their bubbles without being too noticed, really, or getting caught up in whatever, you know, narcissistic shit they've got going on. Um, but, like I said, this is how we set up, and then we kind of dig a little deeper into everybody. Um, but, in a way, there's a lot of things that might seem relatable about this family as we go on. I think, the thing, one of the things that really stood out to me was this continuing thing with, um, Mark and Quinn, and how we kind of get this whole, like, any of the times they were out doing the, uh, school lessons or whatever, or, tr or trying to find something, some activity to connect with, um, that, that was a whole phase me and my brother went through for a while was that whole thing of there was the disconnect from dad so we started doing you know activities together and kind of trying to uh, fill in that gap a little bit and then there's something so real about that scene when Mark reveals that he had an affair and it's this they have this whole discussion about this separation between parents and children and how it's like you would you would think as far as being a family like you you and your parents know everything about each other because you live together you have this relationship where you're like never parted more or less um but then at the same time there's like a whole other side to your parents that's a complete and total stranger to you um like all the way all the way through life uh there will be things that you never know about your parents, and you're really grateful that you'll never know that <laughs> about your parents. Um, and the way they established that and explore that was really interesting. And th those scenes really uh, hit something true, I think. And, and brought a humanity to a character, particularly Mark. Um, because Mark does have this kind of... Fun, like It's the kind of scenario you could see a, any sort of Steve Zahn character getting into uh, comedy or drama when he's completely convinced in a very revealing moment, a very HBO moment, um, that he might have testicular cancer. And then he gets this whole arc in the first episode <laughs> um, where he he seems like he finds new life. And that's one of those things where immediately you kind of... That's when you remember, oh yeah, there's going to be a death that takes place. Um, and then you immediately start getting suspicious. Uh, like, it would be just like Mike White's Sixth Sense of Humor to have a character in the first episode realize, oh my god, I'm alive. And then, like, so now you're suspicious of Mark's safety for, for the rest of the show. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, and there could be something poignant about that, but like I said, it's, with Mike White, you never quite know if you're gonna get really poignant or really, really twisted. Or maybe some weird middle ground he can somehow find that not many other people probably could. Certainly not in the way that he does. Um, and then another person that's very, like, you have a grip on them as soon as you meet them is, uh, Tanya, the Jennifer Coolidge character. And that's something else when I was talking about, when I hadn't watched the show yet, and I started to hear about it blowing up, what I was mainly hearing when this blow-up happened was everybody raving about Jennifer Coolidge. Um, which is another thing, because it, se it seems like she was one of those people where she's, she's been around for a while, obviously, with, like, the Christopher Guest movies, and... I, mean, I guess the American Pie movies, even though that's pr those, those are practically cameos in those, but she's been around a while, and then you still kind of get the vibe that an actress like her, eventually this kind of part comes along, and it's like it was only just kind of a matter of time before Jennifer Coolidge scored a part like this, <laughs> um, and just really completely uh, destroyed it in the best way. And the great thing about her is uh, so many of the characters we've seen her play... Um, mainly in comedies, are, like, sort of so over-the-top and, like, in, like, that sort of comedic best friend kind of way where it's, like, you have the main character and then she's here to kind of be just more boisterous and the comedy's more broad coming from that end. 
Um, and then here, she gets to do something so interesting where it's like, she's, it's, Shane, of all people, compares her to Baby Jane, and I, I don't know how the hell Shane knows <laughs> who Baby Jane is, um, but yet at the same time, that comparison feels so right, um, because it does seem like she comes from, like, this seemingly grand lifestyle, but there's clearly something, and, and apart from the fact that she's carrying her mother's ashes and she's here to spread them, apart from that, there seems to be something separately really tragic about her that we, quite, we can't quite put our finger on, and she's so, like, there's something really heartbreaking about her, but also something, like, uncomfortably but pathetic be the right word? Is that too harsh? I don't know. <laughs> um, particularly her inter her early interactions with Belinda before this becomes a whole uh, sort of mutual thing of one of them kind of using the other, which is where Belinda's flaws kind of start to come in. But, um, but she's also, like, can be really funny and really sad. Like, funny in the way we know Jennifer Coolidge typically would be in, in, in nearly any other role. Um, but then there's, like, this sadness injected into it to where it never, I mean, it, do, it do, there are definitely moments kind of in the middle of the season when it starts to, like, be pure sadness, and we just get, like, glimpses of that as it goes, but a lot of the sadness feels like it's, like, injected into comedy, and, like, Ta Tanya doesn't know she's a half-comedic character, um, but that's, that's sometimes where some of the greatness of characters that don't know their comedic comes from. Um, but what's interesting about that is that, um, she, she's also another one where it's like, you can tell she accomplishes a lot in this performance because what I was talking about earlier about how sometimes things are just so uncomfortable you have to look away and it's like, you're just constantly doing battle with yourself whenever Tanya's on screen because you want to look away because some scenes can get so uncomfortable, but... Cool, just performance is so magnetic you literally can't look away from it and it's just this, this big internal battle you have watching these scenes um because she's one of the in a show that is just so uncomfortable she's like she's a lot of the peak moments of discomfort throughout it and the way she's able to do all of that but keep you constantly watching her it, that takes a lot <laughs> to pull off uh which she has and while there was a lot of praise there for Coolidge, and clearly I've outlined why I think that's accurate, um, this ensemble is so good. It's actually quite interesting to me that anybody got singled out at all in the way that she did. Um, because, I mean, obviously she's got a super meaty character, um, but like this, I can't, like, usually there's the one weak link at least one weak link in an ensemble that's in that can be a really great ensemble and i don't think that weak link is in here at all um like i, I don't even think we get somebody that like is noticeably a little less than everybody else um like it's and the way they each serve the story also like it doesn't feel like anybody has to take a back seat um by the time we get to it and what's interesting about that i think that really stands out is um, anybody that does take a back seat. It it's clear. It feels like there's like a thematic thing going on here. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this uh, whole story has been compared to Parasite a lot, um, and because the whole thing where we see the difference between the staff and the guests and how they interact, and there's and how it's it's this thing where it's like y you almost feel like there's almost some exaggeration here um, with just how different they are and the way they interact. But they're, and then, but the more you think about it, it's like, no, th no this is probably about how this goes in, in places like this. And if, it, if anything, it might be too real. Um, because there's always that thing where you would think, you might think the way people are and how, you know, narcissistic they can be and how much they can just look down and tear apart people that they think are beneath them. Um, people like Shane, for instance, um, it's, you would think, like, you hear stories about them, and you're like, oh, those are probably exaggerated, and then you go out in public for, like, ten minutes, and you'll find one of them, <laughs> and I'll be like, oh, no, if anything, this might be toned down, for all we know, um, but yeah, so that whole disconnect, um, between the staff and the guests is so interesting, because, like I was talking about with the ensemble, nobody having to take a back seat, there are some people that 
take a backseat for the sake of the story and sometimes just disappear entirely. And the thing, what kind of struck me about that was about halfway through the season, I remembered the pregnant girl, the one that was the trainee that started working in the first episode. That, and it kind of builds up like she's going to be a major character and then she starts to have her baby and then she leaves and then it's just we barely ever hear about her again and it's and that's actually like continuous throughout it when it's if, as far as like the staff where it's like there will be characters that just disappear completely without a trace um after their part of the story is done and it's like the way you like the way you see these arrogant people like being served or something and the way they're just so dismissive of anybody like they're like the people that we just talked about that scene in knives out recently when um don johnson hands on to Aramis her, his um plate and he's not even looking at her and she's not even like a maid or anything like that she's the nurse um and it's like that kind of attitude is like we actually get to sort of see that visually um when we have characters like her who just leave and we just never see them again and it's you get that sense that it's like akin to when people like the guests just sort of dismiss the staff entirely without even looking at them. And the thing about that and is that this really kicked in when I realized, and you can see right now it continues, she was built up like she was going to be a main character in the first episode. I don't even remember her name. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like I don't I don't know if I'm falling into that same trap or if it's like that's kind of the intention <laughs> is to show just how dismissed the staff can be um, because there's also the whole thing that for a second there I thought it felt really disjointed but then when I remembered the pregnant girl it's it started to sink in um, the whole subplot with Kai and Paula and how that whole thing plays up because that's a whole Paula's her own can of worms i guess we can open up now that we're here um this was kind of my worry about packing the whole show into one video as it might be a little all over the place but hopefully we'll get to our destination um but to continue on this thing about this being so dismissive of the staff um the fact that this whole high storyline has built up so much and how it starts like it, it opens up all the thing with olivia also and there's such a mystery around it um, there's, like, so much, uh, mystery going on that's not even involving, like, the fact that a character will eventually die. In the way, in the way a lot of it is done, particularly in these earlier scenes, whether it be Olivia being, like, really weird about Paula going off with Kai, or, uh, there's a scene at the end, I think it's the closing shot of the second episode, the first or second episode, when the, the way everything's shot uh, looks really good, but then it's also, like, when it, once it's night, things can start to get a little creepier, so we're just kind of watching this shot of Shane and Rachel in bed, but it's, like, the way, like, you can hear the, the sound of the waves, and the way, like, the score is building, and it's, like, the, from where the camera's placed, it's almost like they're being watched, and it, it suddenly gets this really weird, sinister vibe, and that happens a lot in the whole show, like, it happens repeatedly, at times where you're not even really thinking about it, and it's almost like some like something is sneaking up on you, but then nothing ever quite happens. Um, but it's like it's just kind of that whole vibe of like it's almost like the guests brought something evil with them <laughs> uh, to this. Like it's almost like supernatural or something. Um, just kind of the feel of it in general, like like the the air, like it just feels really like thick or something. <laughs> um, and then, I like, said, so we get that vibe uh, with um, when Olivia's following her around. And then we get in this, this whole Kai thing about how he's got his own thing going on and how Paula's going to help him. And the reason this sticks out is the fact that Paula is the one amongst this family that's really trying to open their eyes and say, you know, like, oh, these people are performing for us, but, like, this is their land. This is, like, their home. This is, like, really weird and very and very symbolic of this whole sort of privilege thing and this taking over thing and these sort of verbal battles that she has with mark over this um and nicole to an extent and paul is kind of really like while she has points she's also very i, I guess instead of trying to elaborate that i'll make it very simple um paula is like twitter <laughs> we're like paula has points and Paula makes sense, 
But when it comes time for Paula to act instead of just talk, um, she's no better than anybody else that's making all the mistakes and the people she's trying to call out. Because um, we get the whole thing where she builds up Kai to do this thing. This, this kind of... Like, regardless of Kai being in a desperate state, um, th this is never the right call, as it turns out, as is shown. Um, and when it comes time for Kai getting trapped in this, what was essentially her idea, um, she's not going to do anything about it. And it's just going to be like, I'm just going to pretend this never happened. Uh, and it's like, that's the kind of thing where it's like, they'll set up one character, and then that character could be an entirely different person than they seem by the end of the show. Um, and this is just after a short vacation <laughs> to show just how transparent these people end up being. And going on the thing about the staff just sort of disappearing because everybody's dismissive of them is the whole thing where it felt very disjointed to me at first that Armand just shows up and says, oh yeah, we caught him and we got your stuff back and he, he's been arrested, he's gone now. Uh, the end, move on, please. Like, have a, try to have a good time now. Um, and it was so weird to me that we just never see him again. Like, there's no, like, there's hardly any wrap-up whatsoever. Just Armand gives us, like, two sentences, and Kai is done. He's just gone entirely. Like, he's been wiped from existence. And, like I said, I, I, that seemed disjointed to me for a second, and then when I remembered the pregnant girl, I was like, I see a theme now, I guess. <laughs> um, and you can even say that, like, about the fact that Armand is the one that gets murdered <laughs> um, over this thing. And let me just say right now... Um, Murray Bartlett, I believe is his name, the guy that plays Armand. I was not familiar with him when I started this show. And uh, I will say right now that despite, I was saying, it's so hard to point out, you know, a star of this ensemble. Um, how do you single out somebody in this ensemble? While I do think it's difficult to single out a performance, and I do think it's very much an ensemble piece where everybody's working so well together, um, I feel pretty comfortable saying that Armand is my favorite character <laughs> in the show. Um, and immediately after I said that, somebody recommended the show Looking, I think it's called, to me. Um, that I guess he's a major character on, so I'll definitely be... I'm just, I think I'm just going to pull up his Wikipedia page and just seek all of it out. Because <laughs> um, if and not being aware of Murray Barlow before this, um, now that I am, I, w I want to be extremely aware of him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything from the past and anything forward. Um, like, it's 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 kind of disappointing um, about the idea of it being an anthology series and the fact that Armand is now dead because if it had been, like, if the second season had been, like, still at this resort, I would, I would have watched an entirely different season of Armand dealing with a new set of people. So it's, it's a shame that it went the way that it did because that would have, that would have made an amazing show. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, uh, yeah, the whole the whole thing that's so interesting about um, well, one of the things that's interesting about Armand with Armand, you gotta kind of go one thing at a time. <laughs> um, the whole feud with Shane is very interesting because, like, I was talking about how things are layered and a little more complex than they seem, and it's like you have to point out one character that you hate more than any other character. I assume most people will point right at Shane. Shane is like the piece of shit. Um, and it's like, even when we get a little bit of an opening and Molly Shannon comes into it, and it's like, oh yeah, it always starts with the parents. And it's like, even though it's been established, oh, that's, that's how Shane got to be the way he was. Doesn't do, it doesn't do anything to change your opinion, nor should it. Uh, <laughs> it's still like, no, Shane's probably still the worst character here. Um, a, ve a very well written and developed character, um, but as far as how you feel about him, as a person, um, terrible. <laughs> so the thing here is that as much as you can just really, really loathe Shane and how fucking entitled and narcissistic and controlling he is, um, he's not entirely in the wrong about this Armand thing. <laughs> Where there was a double booking and Armand basically said, let's try to cover it up. Uh, instead of just going right away and saying, oh man, we fucked up, um, that is what starts this whole thing off. Um, but I guess the whole question, is, like, Sh Shane says it would have been fine if they were just told that up front and then it, it was fixed. Um, but I don't know, Shane's the kind of character where I feel like 
I don't, like, he says that now, but if it had been that simple before, would that have been enough to appease him? That's a whole other story that we'll never know, but, uh, I don't have much faith in Shane as far as being humane goes. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that whole thing, and then, and there's, but that's the thing, is even though we've got, like, two characters that are kind of in the wrong here with Shane, the way it's making him behave, and then Armand, you know, having kind of made the fuck up, it's, it's somehow, like, we, we could easily just say, oh, all these characters are assholes, I'm, I'm getting no joy out of this whatsoever, but Armand is such a great character, and so magnetic, and so fun to watch, that every sort of scheme he tries to pull off to get away with this, um, is just so, and, and, like, the more miserable Shane is, that, like, even if Armand's not really in the right at all, <laughs> um, there's something satisfying about it, and something very fun to watch about it, um, and I feel like Barlow's performance has a lot to do with, like, that, we could have probably maybe hated Armand as much as we hated Shane, but the, the character's just so likable and so interesting and, and and so funny to watch too like the whole thing about like it's a very very dark subplot about him relapsing but at the same time it's been set like as far as him getting the bag from paula the way we've set up how superficial and narcissistic characters like olivia and paula are that's another thing where it's like we know, we know what happened to that bag, and we know that Armand has it, yet somehow, and maybe this is just me, I don't know, but I liked Armand so much, and enjoyed watching his character get away with shit so much, that it was like, I was rooting for them to not get the bag back, even though it was <laughs> taking him in a very dark direction. Um, so it's almost, it's almost just like karma was everywhere. It was just kind of, you know, under the guise of everything else. Um... Which is very funny because of the whole outcome, where it's like, you can say some characters were getting certain karma throughout, but at the end of the day, um, the guests are going to be just fine. Like, that's kind of that thing that's like that, that darkness that Mike White's able to pull off, like the whole thing of, uh, these are, these are all people that aren't exactly great and not perfect whatsoever and deeply, deeply flawed, um, but it's almost always going to still land on the right side for a certain group of people, much more than it would another group. Um, and it's almost just like a dark confrontation of that fact is what the show ultimately leads to. Um, where we even get, um, we even get characters where we're not even quite sure, uh, like, between just the beginning and end of one scene... Um, how we feel about them, where, like, one character might seem sympathetic and the other might seem really, you know, harsh, um, but then it's, yeah, it just kind of keeps changing your perspective of people constantly, um, and, and, and a lot of that comes from the way they're able to have, like, these sort of, like, you're never quite sure who's going to run into who and who's going to interact with who and what's going to happen when that happens. Like, um, in, I think it's the same day, um, Rachel has two very different run-ins with, uh, Steve Zahn and Connie Britton. And what's great about the Connie Britton scene is that it seems like this is going to be kind of a nice scene where she's like, you know, oh, I, I practically worship Nicole and I can actually talk to her. And then this, this scene that seems really nice and the two of them seem like they're kind of bonding over the fact that Rachel practically worships her. And then when this scene reaches its point and Connie Britton realizes who she is and what she's done and whether whether Rachel is aware of how harmful that may have been to her, it's a scene that you that was really building to something, but it was so well crafted you don't realize until the shit hits the fan that it was building to something. And then once Nicole starts to kind of blow up is when we get, you kind of get that sense of oh this scene was building to this this whole time there was some there was some kind of something in there it's just like you almost didn't realize it was tension because uh, it was so pleasant for a little bit um, but then when you see like the whole layout of the scene it's like oh that was that was always coming uh, <laughs> even though they didn't quite know he she didn't know who she was right away um, it's still just the way the scene is crafted was getting us there before we even knew it before the characters even knew it um, which is just 
it, it takes a lot of talent to get there. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to figure out, um, what else, uh, there is to go to. Like I said, I'm, I'm very unorganized here because just doing the whole thing here, but, um, I think the main point to get to is that thing about how everybody kind of ends up on the other side, and the fact that everybody is kind of still in their kind of bubble, regardless of where they are, or how they end up, or what they've been through. It's all going to always land on the same side for these people, um, and always end up bad for the guests. But at the same time, talking about how not everybody comes out uh, looking perfect, like how, like I said, with, with Belinda, you had the whole thing where it was, she's the character that seems to have the most conscience and she's the one that's trying the hardest to be a good person. Um, but there's so much about these interactions with Tanya and the direction they go that feel very off when you know that it's like, when she knows that Tanya is a potential investment plan. And it's like the kind of, you can sense some of the hum, like the humility in her kind of flake away a little bit. And it's almost like, like I was talking about how like the guests kind of brought an evil with them, how it kind of feels like that, and how it's like, it almost feels like it might be rubbing off on Belinda a little bit, where it's like, if she sees an opportunity, um, and it's there, and so it's like, this this deeply emotionally troubled woman um, that's very, very lonely and desperate for some kind of friendship, particularly with Belinda, um, and it's like, I'll, I'll find a way to kind of have this as an advantage, and I think the thing that makes that even darker than that sounds is this very last scene when she, like, gets the money from her after like the in this whole thing about how Tanya goes on this whole thing about it's no more transactional relationships and stuff like that and that we see when uh John Grise comes into this John Grise who is probably most often lovingly referred to as Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite um who shows up and is terminally ill and it's like Tanya came here grieving and now she's what she the one person she just happens to find. It's almost like you can see Tanya going back into old circles through her own doing, and it also feels like just kind of a cruel joke played on her by the universe. <laughs> and it's like that's that constant balance that Tanya's had the whole show, like complete from her introduction. Um, and then the fact that she gives this final transaction, saying like you know I'm never this is you know the last time I'm gonna do this, even though it's probably not depending on how you see the John Grease situation, um, how a transactional relationship isn't always just money related. Um, but the fact that she does give her this money and how the whole thing was down to, I can get money from her to start this thing, hopefully. Um, and then to see her just kind of throw the plan away after she's gotten this clear, at least head start. Um, so, uh, something about Belinda suddenly doesn't feel right in a way that it kind of feels like we were building to. Um, as we saw her interactions with Tanya and how they kind of gradually became what they became throughout, how there was much more of an, like, it was almost like an, oh my god, I feel sorry for her, let me hang out with her, and it kind of got more hollow as it went. Um, like I said, you can maybe just say that's what the guests bring with them, <laughs> uh, and what just working here in general in a place like this can do to people that even have the most clear consciences. Um... But um, then there's the whole thing where we have um, Rachel, who seems like a character. And, uh, as far as Alexandra Daddario here, um, she was an actress that I have kind of um, accused in the past of not having much particular range and kind of basically being hired for, like, eye candy, which isn't her fault. That's like a, you know, the, the people that would cast her and the stupid shit they would put her in. Um, but I never really saw much in regards to, like, oh, she could really take a really meaty role. Um, but, and, and I kind of was still getting that vibe for, like, the first half of this, but then as we kind of get into the second half, and Rachel starts to get more layers unraveled, like everybody else, um, she accomplishes a lot, and, and it's not having to necessarily do a lot either, like, not having to be over dramatic. Um, there's a lot of subtlety in Rachel's character in the second half that she really pulls off well, and it's, like, to the point that it's... When she ends up going back to Shane at the end, which is kind of terrifying, but, once again, anything in this show that seems almost, you know, 
terrifying or exaggerated is probably just actually too real. Like, it's the opposite of exaggerated. Um, but there's a certain subtlety in here where we kind of get the vibe of there's almost a lack of surprise when she actually just sort of submits to a life with Shane. Um, and it's and it's points like that that I think are going to make this show really stick out in a way that kind of just goes into people's minds and doesn't get out. And that's something that Mike White has always been really good at, like I was talking about with Chuck and Buck. Um, but the different ways he has of doing that, um, where Mike White is far from like a one-trick pony kind of thing, where it's like he can do... He can do the same thing to an audience, <laughs> like give them the same feelings, but using totally different methods in totally different ways, with totally different characters, in totally different situations. And and, that, and the fact that just the darkness looming over this show, because there's even, um, you can even look at it as um, what Quinn has going on, where Quinn's the character you kind of want to root for, because he's, he's the character, I don't know quite what it was, but I just kept having this feeling he was going to be the one to die for some reason. <laughs> and so for him to get this, to kind of start to see things, like when he sees the whale, and then when he starts to have this whole epiphany of, like, the whole thing is that I'm just in the wrong place, and which is a very teenager thing to think, and it's like you can relate to that because you've probably been there at some point in your life, particularly in your youth. Um, and there's something really real about him, but the way it just seems like he's living this tortured existence with these people that barely care about him. Like, the the interactions with Mark are, like, the most humanity that Quinn sees. Like, particularly the way he's treated by Olivia and Paul is just, like, practically infuriating. Because um, it's just so unnecessarily shitty. And this is just how he lives. And, like, just literally being closed off in another room just perfectly symbolizes his existence especially with his family and how he doesn't fit with them really like he's this sort of like the, the, it's easy for teenagers to get into this feeling where it's like their family who should know them clearly has no idea who they are like we talked about that with mark and how par we don't know our parents but it's like when we're still at when we're still at the age that quinn is at Parents should probably still know their kids very well, um, and the fact that he just feels like he's on a completely different planet than the people that should really, really care about him, um, and you get this sense that you really want to see him succeed and find his own way, uh, and when he finds those rowing dudes, and it's like it's, he finally found his thing, and like his people... It's like he's never experienced anything like this before, and it's like he, like he finally has a place in the universe, which is the place that we all strive to get to at some point. And then you, th and then you think about it, and that, that seems like a very happy ending, but then it's basically like when it like cuts to black and ends is basically right exactly when reality sets in. Because it's like when he runs away from the airport and he goes out there, when everything is happening, when we're watching it, it's like, yeah, he's doing his thing. He's going to go live off and do his own thing. And then as soon as it ends and we realize we're back, in it's basically like the whole thing of like being in a movie and being in that world. And then as soon as it ends, you're back in reality. As soon as the show ends, you can, pro like, if you're thinking clearly, you can see Quinn's reality. And it's like, well, that's not going to work out. <laughs> that is not going to be his life. <laughs> Um, he'll, he'll probably spend the day with them until his family realizes what happened, and then they'll come back, and even, even, okay, let's just say his family just left and said, yeah, let him live his own life, um, in that very, um, non-existent circumstance, um, how, how's, how's he gonna live, you know, like, it's just so, it's, it's clearly a kid having a pipe dream, <laughs> but it's like, like I said, just that whole feeling of just knowing reality is setting in as soon as the show ends, and we kind of, because the whole idea of the show where it just kind of has, like, that very dark and nasty feel to it, where we kind of get the underlying things of all the other characters, and it's like, the contrast of this setting uh, is... <laughs> <laughs> it's just the whole thing where it just feels like there's this whole darkness underneath. Like I said, I've, a lot of the themes feel like they match Parasite in this really uh, interesting way, in this really sort of cohesive way. Like they, like almost they could be companion pieces to each other. Um, 
and how like everybody's lies behind closed doors are that extra basement. Um, while up here everything's really, you know, tropical and nice and sunny and the weather's perfect and all that and it's like it's it's anything but it's really, really dark and ugly and at times eerie, especially the way it's shot. <laughs> um, and so uh, I, it's very interesting to me uh, how much this show took off, but I'm really happy that it did. And I'm very interested about uh, how they handle the anthology thing. Um, so uh, we'll see that. If, if it's still Mike White doing it, um, like if he maybe had ideas in advance, then I'd probably trust it pretty well, but I don't really know much about it other than the fact that it's going to be an anthology series, so we'll see what happens. Um, so uh, I think that's pretty much in general uh, what I would have to say about the show. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about TV-wise is going to be Mayor of Easttown. I'm going to try to do the same thing. We're going to just talk about the show just in one go uh, and see where we end up. And in between then, obviously, we've got um, more reviews and verses and other stuff. Um, we're going to go through Robert Rodriguez's trilogy, all that stuff. So, uh, and new reviews, just a whole bunch of stuff. So until all that stuff, uh, I think that's it.